Welcome, guys, back to the Grateful Living Podcast. Today, I'm thankful to have Roland Berry with me. Roland is a contemporary artist residing in Los Angeles, California. His work bridges the gap between fine art, pop art, and graffiti. His signature style features silk screening, complex layering, and a powerful range of colors. Roland, thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here. Of course. Uh, thankful to have you on. So, you know, for people that don't know you as well, can you kind of set the scene for us, you know, take us back to the beginning, uh, where you grew up, your family right. situation, what sure. type of kid you were, things like that. Yes. Evil. Uh, <laughs> really easy. Um, I was born here in California. Then we moved to Arkansas when I was like a year and a half. So I actually grew up in rural Arkansas. And when I say rural, I'm talking about as rural as something could be like farmhouse, originally no running water, that kind of rule. Right. So a lot, a lot of times people assume because I do all this stuff with art, like, oh, he came from a trust fund or he got this money or that. It's like everything I did, I made myself. Like there was no secret family member. They're like, here, take a million dollars and figure it out, kid. Um, so extremely, I, I would say what's equal to extreme poverty. Right. Um, but real farm, like chickens, cows, pigs. Hey, you want to stay warm? Go cut the wood to stay warm. If you don't cut the wood, you fucking freeze. Like literally that kind of like mentality. And um, I guess learning through that and like the work ethic of like, hey, I'm on a farm. Or maybe it was the, the modality of, hey, I'm on this fucking farm. I really don't want to be on this farm. I should figure my life out. This, this is like conversations of a six-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> it's wow. like, I don't want to be yeah. here any longer than I have to. I got to do something. So yeah, start off very young like that. Um, I was, a, I, I guess they, I think now they, it's easier at identifying kids. Uh, but back then they were just like, you are the absolutely most disruptive, most horrible student you are. It, it just, my brain was going a thousand times faster than what they were giving me. Yeah. So I mean, it was year after year. After, I mean, expulsion, uh, not allowed in class anymore. Have to take now you're doing now you you're in the principal's office for a whole year doing your like for I mean crazy things crazy things. So um, I guess if 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 I want to be specific, I would say part of what made me who I am is um, I w I was not malleable. Like I had my own version of what I was going to do. And, and there's a lot of like, uh, and obviously a lot of people don't know these kind of stories. So I don't share them. Um, for example, in fourth grade, went into fourth grade and said, Hey, cool. Check it out. I'm not, I'm not doing any more homework. It's useless. I can do it in my head. Your homework doesn't make sense. I'll be drawing. And so that's what I did for a whole year. No home. And when, and then, and then they failed me, even though, even though I passed every test was like top of the class. They're like, no, 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 you, you didn't learn because you have to do this. So mm. I was made to repeat the fourth grade twice. Wow. And then the second, fourth grade, I was so adamant. At that point, they removed me from the classroom and I had to, I, I was educated inside the principal's office in his office. And I would come in like 8 a.m. And by 10 a.m. all my work was done and I would draw. And then he came in and said, this is a real Arkansas conversation. Yeah. He came in and said, why are you drawing? And I said, because I finished all my work. He goes, we'll see about that. He checks it. Of course, it's all done. And he said, look, you're going to end up being a ditch digger, a probably in jail or manual labor with your life. This is what I'm being told when I'm in fourth grade. Yeah. Okay. He said, so from now on, after, after I think about 10, 30, 11 a.m., I would go and work with the sanitation. This is in Arkansas. So they had me out mowing lawns. Oh my God. And working with these guys who are like 65 years old, smoking cigarettes, doing shit with tractors. Like they, we had like a 4 H club. They're like, oh yeah, go out and mess with the cows, do this and do that. So imagine that all of my other peer students are in class doing one plus one equals two. And I'm literally out there being like, oh yeah, I'm going to mow the lawn. Like very wow. weird culture in Arkansas. And it would, the culture was, we're going to break you. We're going to break you. We're going to break you. And we're going to show you how we're going to break you. But that, that stuff just actually, um, I would say, gave me the, the timber, which I built myself out of, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
So that, that yeah. kind of, but it went, but I mean, it's, it's a long story. It's like year after year, after year, after year, after year, it's like every year problems, every year problems. One, one year, every day I was, was spanked every day, one year. Yeah. Literally the wood paddle. This is oh, old God. school. Yeah. This, is, this is not because it's like <laughs> they, corporal punishment. We're, we're going to beat it out of you. Yeah. So it'd be like every day. Okay. Wow. And, and the, the, there's a law in Arkansas that there was, it said you, one teacher can only spank you three times. So I had the teacher, the vice principal, the principal, and the whatever, the head of the school. Some days I would get 12. They would just send me from, from, from teacher to teacher to get my ass spanked. Wow. So, but, but that stuff really forged me being like me against them, mm -hmm. me against the system. Yeah. So, and I think a lot of who I am now came from the angst of all that. And then, you know, over, you know, dealing with poverty as a kid being like, okay, Hey, we don't have running water. Hey, there's not enough food. There's not this. There's like a completely different animal than I think what people in 2022 generally deal with. Yeah. I'm, uh, you know, curious, you know, the confidence to be yourself at that age to me is is kind of mind blowing because I think there are people that even in their forties, fifties, sixties never end up ever truly being authentically themselves. Um, where where how you know especially in the midst of you know authority and I mean this is not you know this is no social media no other well, nothing, creative yeah. outlets where you can make money you can't make money as a video right you know gamer were, or anything right, were, this, no, yes. it's college it's school it's you know well also and, and my parents were uh you know good parents for the most part um not very educated and so the the goal for me was to become a non-educated their goal, not my parents, but the school's goal was a, a non-educated worker, you know, and so was literally lumped into the lowest of the low or like whatever, you know, that kind of situation. Um, but um, being um, extremely smart um, and, and, and later, later, like when I, I think sometime when I got around seventh grade, because they kept talking about one they I mean, they got to the point where they're putting me in um, uh, like the special learning classes because they thought, Oh, there's something really wrong with this guy. There was nothing wrong with me. There was just no challenge. Yeah. Like I didn't need your, the, what you're giving me. I don't need. Right. And I identify that really early. And my mom, my mom always was like, do what you think's best and keep doing artwork. So that was the positive. Right. And then yeah. the negative was like, you're going to be a ditch digger. Da, 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 da. You're you know worthless. You'll be in jail. Blah, 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 blah. Um, and I think sometime around seventh grade, they do a, 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 a they did Arkansas did like a national testing, and I came out in the top one percent. And then I got a letter from the governor being like, "Hey, you scored great. You made Arkansas." And, and all the teachers were like, "Wait, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. like, like, you're the guy who mows the lawn. How did you?" I was t like top one percent in the United States. Mm -hmm. It was like a, it was a it was a state. It was a test to see where the education system was. And then um, they obviously compared all the states or whatever, but it was like top 1%. It's like, how does that happen with the guy who literally is telling the teacher, I'm not going to listen to you and I'm not going to do homework. So, yeah. and then after that, I just went back to being an asshole. Yeah. I was like, cool, prove my point. Now I'm back to doing what I want to do. Where, where's that, where's that confidence come from to be yourself? I was just, it, I think it was, I, I, if my mother would, my mother would say I came here with it to be honest. Like, yeah. I was never, I always knew I was going to be an artist. I always knew I was going to paint. I always knew I was going to be creative, really good at like figuring things out and, and, you know, communicating and figuring out systems and ways to make money and things like that. And then later I'll flash forward later in, in my twenties was homeless and stuff like that. I moved out from my parents when I was 15 and I was like, I'm out. Like I'll figure my life out was homeless, whatever, finished high school living at friends houses right wow. like if you were my friend i'd be like hey can i come stay at your house tonight and you'd be like yeah then i would try to stay for as long as possible mm. and eventually your parents would come in on like week two they'd be like you've been here for two weeks 
maybe you should go home. And I would just go to my next friend and be like, hey, hey, Bill, can I come stay at your house? And then they would let me stay. for. So literally, that's how I survived for a while. Finished high school, did that. And then later just started, uh, literally started my art career and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I'm also curious, uh, just, you know, as you look at society today, you know, and, you know, the, the modern day kid that's like you, um, you know, how, how do you think school systems or parents should, you know, address kids like you where where do where does a kid like you fit in to or do they honest, fit in yes, that, to be, okay to be honest i feel like if you if you have wealth and this is a disparity between those who have and who don't if you have wealth it's you're identified at a very young age as being a positive student and having abilities and they you know encourage you right if you don't have wealth then why would they encourage you They're, you can't go to a private school you can't there is no like, hey, let's try to, you know, shore them up or make them better. or what. So th- that's what happened. It was just like, he's here and this is where he's going to be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, literally, that's what happens. And I, I think that a lot I mean, I have so many friends here in L.A. and everybody has kids. I don't have kids. Everyone has kids and all, they're all going to these crazy private schools where like they don't even have grades. And they're like, what do you feel like doing today? How are you feeling today? Oh, you don't have to wear shoes if you don't want to wear shoes. So it's. It's like yeah. a very different process than what I went through. But, yeah. but my, my, like I said, my process of that kind of situation and coming from like literally nothing and not knowing anything about business and not knowing anything about anything, um, it, it forged me to where I had to be better at what I do. Right. Like yeah. I, 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 like literally, I think I, somewhere around, I don't know, in my early teens, I realized like, Hey, I don't have a safety net. So why am I pretending like everyone else? I'm just going to go it on my own and figure it out. And, and then by the time I was in my early 20s, I think around 24, I started my first company. And I went from borderline not being able to pay my rent, like literally having to jump out of the window to run for my landlord because I couldn't pay my $400 a month. And to like after I started my company, having like the first year was like $500,000 in sales. And not even, and, and also no, with no education about money. Like, what, yeah. oh, now I have this money. What do I do? So, yeah, I mean, I have a, I'm, I'm kind of a, um, a, a, now I'm like, you see all those guys on uh, Instagram and YouTube and they're talking about 10X this and 10X that. Many, many, many projects that I've done, I've 100 x you know, ex- except yeah. I'm, I'm not doing a, you know, a motivational and telling people how to do it, you know, because that's not really my personality. Yeah. But I'm saying I would have to take something that was like literally nothing and figure out how to turn that into thousands and then thousands and hundreds of thousands and later millions. Right. And that's that's part of the process. That's the, those are the things I figured out. Yeah. I'm uh, curious. Can you talk about um, how you first got into art? I know you, you said. OK, you know, so it was. Yeah. Um, all through grade school, painted, drew ever since I was a kid, drew paint, drew paint. Then when I was in high school, did have some good teachers in high school, saw that I was talented and kind of like that was like my safe haven of like being someplace where I could like be creative. And basically they would just leave me alone finally. Right. So leave him alone. Let him do his thing. That happened when I got older. Um, Really funny. When I moved, I moved back to California. And so in ninth grade, they they there's like a test. You do tests like to see what what where you are, you know, college prep advanced. This is and I was advanced everything. And then I realized that didn't serve me either. So by the time um, I really good at creative writing, but really bad at spelling, not my thing. Yeah. And my English teacher, when I was 11th grade, she's like, you know, she goes, maybe you're dyslexic. And I'm not dyslexic. But I thought, you're right. I should take the dyslexic test. Took the dyslexic test, made sure that I failed the dyslexic test. Not kidding. Like wrote, they put me in a room. They said, okay, you have 75 minutes to do the test. And it was like, I think a hundred questions. And I went through and just said, Oh, guess, 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 guess. But then I thought, what if I guessed randomly and I got enough right that I'm not dyslexic. So then I went back through, took out a tablet, wrote down the right answers just in case it backfired and then made sure that I had at least 75% of the answers wrong. So when I entered my senior year, they said this whole time we made a mistake with you, you are special needs. 
and all my classes changed to where they, like I would like go to English class and they would read because they're like, oh, you can't read. Mm-hmm. And obviously I can read. And the, it, I just rigged it to where I was like, I, the information they're giving me, I don't need. I know what I need in my life. And I just wanted the least amount of time doing work and the most amount of time doing art. Mm-hmm. Except this guy who taught me when I was a freshman, he taught um, advanced uh, history, which was one thing I was really good at. And then he also taught the English second language government class that you have to pass to, to graduate. And I walked into his class. He's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, this is the class I'm in. He's like, no, you're not. He's like, you got an A in my class and you never brought a book. And I go, ends up I'm dyslexic. And he's like, no, you're not. And they we went to the principal. The principal's yeah. like, look, he tested into your thing. He goes, he's cheating. I go, I, that's ridiculous. And so they brought me back. And then he put me up in front of every, this crazy story. He yeah. put me up in front of the class. He goes, and in this class were people who were struggling, gang members, a bunch of different kind of people, and, yeah. he, and aggressively hard people, right? The kind of people who sold drugs at school and also carried weapons, right? Yeah. And he was like, this guy is going to fail you because no matter what class, we, we grade on a bell curve in here. So no matter what happens, he's always going to be smarter than everyone in this class. So he's going to keep all of you from graduating. So you can go home and tell your parents, this guy stopped you from graduating, which, which caused massive problems, obviously. And then mm. I had to go to him and tell him, look, you're, they're going to kill me. Like, they're fucking pissed off. Like, they're really mad. Yeah. He's like, okay, new plan. You have to tutor two students. If you tutor these students and if they pass the government, then you pass. You don't take the test. Just if you tutor them and they pass. So senior year, I tutored, like, gang members to pass. Wow. And I'd be like, yo, get your book out. I'm like, all right, cool. They would open their book and inside their book, they'd cut out a space and they had like a fucking knife or a gun or drugs inside their book. I'm like, dude, yeah. <laughs> I was like, you need this book because you have to pass. So, that, <laughs> so that's how I like graduated high school was tutoring people that I got myself in the classes with. Yeah. And then the rest of my time, it was just like free. It's like, okay, cool. You're in the art class, do this. And, this. and so everything was like, what can I do to get more time painting or drawing or whatever, where, where I felt like they were nourishing my abilities instead of discounting my abilities. Yeah. So that, de- that decision to uh, move from uh, Arkansas to LA and um, at times, you know, um, you know, homeless um, you know, how, how did you make that decision? Like, that's such a tough decision as a 15 year old. Yeah. But I, for me, it was never tough. Cause I never, I, I didn't, like I said, I didn't have a safety net. And when I was like 13 or 14, I, I wrote a, wrote a proposal to my parents and I was like, Hey, here's your money. Here's your debt. Here's what you're doing in Arkansas. Here's your money. Here's your debt. Here's your possible earning. If we can move back to California, I, pr- I propose we move back to California and do this because it's going to be better for everybody. And then my parents were like, you're right. And so I got my parents to move back to California. Yeah. And then because I knew that if I wanted, I kept thinking like, hey, I'm going to end up in California anyways. I, I can't possibly do. I don't want, I didn't want to be on the farm anymore. So after my financial proposal at like 14, they agreed and we moved to California. Yeah. So I was that kid. Yeah. I'm like, hey, look, I've been thinking about this. I ran the numbers on, on what we're doing, and it doesn't make sense. I was like, our farm is losing money. Here's why. <laughs> Let's wow. move here and have better life. I'm like, look, you can spend the same money, and we'll be close to the beach, and it'll be nice. And that's how I sold the move here. And then I stayed with them for, I think, a year and a half or something like that. And that's when I left. And then um, similar, I, I technically probably shouldn't have got – I went to – a place called uh, Pasadena Art Center, which is like a pretty renowned school. And I luckily, luckily I was in class one of the days and they said, oh, the, the people from the art college are coming and they're going to talk about portfolios. And really quickly, I made a portfolio and they allowed me to go to Pasadena Art Center as directly from high school, which is like kind of unheard of, right? Because usually you have to go to another school first and then before they allowed you to come in. So I went on scholarships there, stayed there. I was there for like, I think two semesters. And again, I was like, I don't want to work for someone. I don't want to end up in a cubicle. I'm like, this is, they're making, you know, uh, all the designers from like Audi and Ford come out of there. And there was some fine art stuff. And, and then one of my teachers was 
my figure drawing teacher was like, you know, he goes, I don't think you're cut out for this. He goes, try a place called Otis. So Otis Parsons. I had never heard of it. It was in downtown LA. I went there. They were like, okay, we see you got scholarships at that school. That doesn't matter. Bring us your portfolio. I did. And let's do a cell portrait. My cell portrait was, I went home. I got a brown paper bag because we used to have paper bags, not plastic. I drew my face on it. I crumpled it up. I walked in the Dean of Admissions office. I dropped it on his desk. I go, that's my cell portrait. And he's looked at me. He goes, we accept you. We'll give you a scholarship. Like that. Wow. He's like, no one in the history of Otis, no one's ever drawn themselves on a paper bag, crumpled it and dropped it on our desk. And that's, that's how it's, I just, my, my whole life has been a side door. Like I never go the direct way. I have to go, I go my way. They gave me scholarships. I did that for a couple of years, but it didn't matter because the scholarships, I still couldn't eat. You mm. know what I mean? It's like, okay. Yeah. It's like, I didn't have money to make artwork. And then eventually I had a, another couple of good teachers who asked me, you know, what I wanted in life. And they said, look, you're really good at what you do. You should probably just quit and get a studio and start painting, which sounds ethereal. And I was young. So I thought that was possible, um, which is a hard thing to do. Um, so I was leaving and I went to the Dean of Fine Arts at the school. And she's like, look, if you stay, I will get you and you, you will be the next big guy. You're going to be, I'll get you in a graduate school and you do this, you do this and this, like, like, painting me a really interesting picture. At the time I was dating a girl at the art school and she was also going to the fine arts department and, but they didn't know we were dating. And as she's in there deciding she's gonna go into fine arts, they started using, like dropping my name. You know, we have this new guy, his name's Roland Berry. He's this, he's this, he's this. So she comes home and tells me all this, which is, makes her irate, right? She's like this asshole. Like they're, they're, they're literally, the guy that I live with are saying he's like the best artist at the school. And then I went back in and I just said, Hey, cool. I quit. And she's like, wait, what do you mean? Why do you quit? We're giving you all these scholarships. I go, look, I'm like, you can't, I don't want you using me as a credit to have other students. I'm like, it doesn't make sense to me. I was like, you know, I, I hate the politics. So I was like, I'm done. And so at that point I quit. And then, you know, then became more homeless if that's possible. And, um, and then, then from then, uh, later, uh, I'm, I'm skipping fast. To, to yeah, yeah, that's fine. Catch you up. Later, got a job at a place called Fred Siegel. Yeah. Right. Got a job at a place called Fred Siegel. It's a big fashion store here on the on the West Coast. And they were like, they give me, they looked at me and they're like, all right, don't talk, because I, I guess I look mean. And they're like, <laughs> you stand here and you're the security guy. Okay. And I'm like, okay. And this is like, you know, ninety seven something like that. Yeah. And one day the manager did not show up and there were people coming in the store. And that day I did $3,500 in sales. And so then, you, you know, you would do it and then you would send the thing over to the parent company and they would check it and they would say, well, who did the sales? And I said, I did. They're like, Oh, you can sell. I was like, yes. And so then it was like, Oh, then you're a sales guy now. And then I later, I became a manager and then I left and then they brought me back again and said, look, Oh, run this section, do this. And so I ended up, I don't know if it's accidentally or on purpose. I ended up, my first education was in art. My second education was identifying customers at Fred Siegel at a high level and understanding that customer and how they consume. And then about halfway through there, I just started a brand. And I said, look, my, my concept was this. Hey, I have $25 in my bank account. I'm riding the bus from middle of LA on Santa Monica Boulevard um, in, in, a, in a very bad district, riding a bus an hour and a half to get there, riding it back. I have nothing. I can't be any poorer. I was like, I can't be poor. It's not possible. I don't have money to eat. I was like, so fuck it. Um, and there was a guy, his name was Alex. And, and, and I, I attribute a lot of my success to people who, changed my trajectory in life. Yeah. And that's why still like if people want to come into my studio and it, you know, especially if they have like, you know, younger kids, their art collectors, I'm like, bring your kids. I'll talk to them about painting. I'll try to, because I think that people in your life can just change your trajectory and your whole life can change. Yeah. And that's what happened. A guy came in and he kept coming into Fred Siegel and he was like a close talker. He would get 
you know, sit, I'm not, I'm not a close talker. I'm a, I like distance. Yeah. And he kept saying, Hey man, he's like, you know, I really think you should come to my studio. And I didn't know what the deal was. And, and, and I was young, handsome Roland and I'm working at a fashion store. So a lot of times, you know, it was a guy, maybe they were coming, maybe they were hitting on me. Right. And mm-hmm. I, I was just like, no, 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 no. And he, he kept going for like two months. And then finally I was like, ah, fuck it. I was like, I'll go. And I went to his little studio and it ends up that he was a guy who um, was, he was from um, Pittsburgh, which is where Warhol's from. Yeah. And he actually had worked in the silk screen in some of the places that made Warhol stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'd never studied silk screen when I was in art school because I, I was a fine artist. And as soon as I saw it, it made sense to me. And I was like, Oh, this is how my brain works. And his, that little conversation with him changed the trajectory of my life. And I learned silk screening from him and learned the art of silk screening. And, and literally he would like, I was so poor. He would have to give me a ride back at like, so I would work all day, go to his place, at, ride a bus to his place at eight o'clock, get there at eight, set up and start creating artwork or try to learn silk screen until 2 a.m. And I'd be like, all right, man, I'm going to take the bus. He's like, man, he's like, I'll just give you a ride. And so this went on. And within six months, I had $500,000 in POs. Wow. So I, like literally, like it was like you, I, like I would like ride a bus every day. Like I was telling you on Santa Monica Boulevard and I would pass this Volvo dealership. And I'm, the whole time I was like, man, I really like those Volvos. I really like those Volvos. Until one day I rode the bus there with $24,000 in my pocket, got off and I was like, I'll take this car. And they're like, they're like, what? And I was like, I'll take this car. They're like, how are you going to buy the car? You don't have any money. I was like, I have money. I'm, I'm taking this car. And I paid for the car in cash. So I literally rode the bus there, got the car, paid for it, and just drove off. So that's it. That, that kind of thing has been how I've ran my life. Yeah. Like, you know, just, I'll, I'll just be like, okay, that's what I want. I'm going to go get that. I'll figure out how to get it. And they were like, they like wouldn't even, they didn't even want to take my money. Like, how'd you get the money? Is this like drug money or something? And then that was at the beginning of the internet, like probably 99 or something. Yeah. And I was like, oh, and I'll, I just said, oh, it's internet. And they're like, oh yeah, internet. That's how you make over money. I'm like, yeah, internet. And then I bought the car. So that's in a nutshell, kind of how I am and, and, yeah. and how I've done things, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think a lot of people try creative pursuits, whether it's art, music, whatever. And, you know, as the years go on, it can be discouraging. Um, you know, maybe if you haven't, quote unquote, made it, you know, in two years or whatever, uh, or gotten a big win. I'm I'm curious, you know, like, did you, were you before this point in 99 was there ever a point where you considered stopping art like listen i'm homeless like maybe i should just get a practical job and just you know maybe just do it as a hobby or like was there ever a breaking point for you or did you always believe no 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 my my practical job that i that i allowed myself to have was the one at fred seal because i had to have some kind of food yeah but but i i came to a point when i was there and i was talking to people who worked above me or managers or owners or whatever and i realized in these conversations that they weren't necessarily more intelligent than i was and they didn't necessarily know more than what i knew it was just that they had access to other avenues that i didn't have and once i figured that out i was like well then i just have to create the avenues Right. And so like, I literally had a book, a little, one of those little tiny notebooks, like the mead ones that I don't even know if they make them anymore. Like yeah, little, yeah. And I would have the book. And every time something came in, I, I would watch it come in. I'd say, okay, Stussy came in and Navy gray, white and blue came in. Now then I would watch how the consumers would consume. And I'd say, okay, the, the Navy sold, the gray sold, the black sold, the white was the least selling the red was, and I would just make little diagrams and I would say, okay, this is other consuming. And then I also learned from being there, which is a, a really valuable lesson. I learned that people want something that's unique, mm-hmm. right? And, and they, not only do they want something unique, they want, there's a very big, and it, I mean, it's huge in social media now, the, the I have it, you don't have it culture, right? Yeah. Even if I can't afford it, you're going to think I have it, right? Yeah. And I, I caught on to that. And my first brand, I mean, the first thing I did was sell t-shirts where I worked. 
right? Sold those and they blew out. Like I'm talking about like, I think at that point they were probably paying me in a month. I would be lucky if I was making a thousand a month, right? This is 1999 or 1998. And in the, the first time I did clothing, my first check from the clothing from them was $2,400. And I was like, well, this makes sense. I was like, I just made more money. To, and I just made up art and put it on t-shirts. I was like, okay, I can run with this. And then I did it a couple times. And like, basically like what drug dealers do, where you buy something for this, you flip it, you step on it, you flip it, you step it and you flip it. And that's what I was doing with my money. I would make 2,400 and I take that 2,400, reinvest it and figure out how to make like seven grand, make seven grand, how to make 14 grand. And I just kept going and flipping. And um, again, trajectory. There was a girl who came in, her name was Joie. I remember her name, very, very attractive girl. And she came in and, and because I worked at Fred Siegel, she had a pile of t-shirts in the pile of t-shirts. She worked for urban outfitters. I didn't know that at that time yet. Yeah. And um, she had like 10 t-shirts, eight of the 10 were mine, my brand. And my version of selling to people is basically fucking with them. Like I was like, I'm like, yo, what's up with those t-shirts? She's like, yeah, I'm getting those. I'm like, yeah, those are mine. And she's like, what? She's like, do you even work here? Because I would dress like this. Mm. There's no code. So you wouldn't know I necessarily worked there. And um, I was like, yeah, those are mine. She goes, you're weird. And she kind of walks off. Right. And then she kind of goes over the counter and I come around the counter. I'm like, Hey, what's up? I'm like, those are my t-shirts. She goes, okay, you're freaking me out. Can I talk to the manager? I go, hold on one second. Let me get him. I'm like, hi, those are my t-shirts. She goes, why do you keep saying that? I'm like, those are my designs. And she goes, wait, 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 wait. You designed those? And I was like, yeah. She goes, oh, well then I don't want to buy them. She goes here. And she gave me her business card. She's like, I'm the head of something for urban outfitters, whatever. And I was like, okay. And I, especially from being in LA because I, everything is bullshit. So I was like, okay, whatever. She gave me her, her, her card and she asked for my cell phone number. And I was like, Oh, now you want my number. She's <laughs> like, seriously, dude. And I was like, okay, all kidding. I was like, okay. She's like, do you have a fax? And I didn't have a fax. I go, yeah, I scared my home phone number. At that time I had a home phone number in a cell. This is a real story. And so whatever about a month later i would be in my little hobble apartment that i couldn't pay for it was like 400 bucks a month and and it was the apartment was in the area of los angeles where it is known for um uh, male prostitution and and because i couldn't afford anywhere else a male yeah. prostitution and like just trans prostitute it was just yeah. a bad area it was a yeah, bad yeah. area right it was yeah. a bad bad area so i'm saying i'm painting a picture so it's it's like uh, imagine you know imagine downstairs people are literally paying to have sex and they're paying to have sex so it's like and then i'm in my little tiny not even in one bedroom as a studio like trying to paint and do weird shit and so all of a sudden about four in the morning my my phone ring and i it'll wake me up and i pick it up and be like and, I'm up. <laughs> and this went on for like two weeks Every day at four in the morning. And so I finally called one of my friends and I was like, Hey man, are you fucking pranking me, dude? Cause he's a nerd, right? I was yeah. like, did you program something and prank me? He goes, what are you talking about? I go every day at 4 AM from four to 5 AM, my phone won't stop fucking ringing. It goes, he goes, he goes, I think that's a fax. I'm like, Oh, I went to a thrift store bargained for, they are like, we want $25 for the fax machine. I'm like, how do I know it works? Got it for like 15 bucks. Plugged it in. And I was like, we'll see what happens. Phone rings at 4 a.m. I'm fucking passed out dead. Look out of the corner of my eye. See the, the machine's doing something. I was like, ha ha. Wake up a few hours later. And that's, that was the first $100,000 I had in orders. Wow. Like, wow. it was just like, and it was like each style. And, and it, times were different then because there weren't a lot of people making t-shirts and t-shirts weren't really available so much. And there was internet wasn't really going and there wasn't an American apparel. There wasn't a place to get blanks. There wasn't. So this, the weird things I had learned were like little hacks for the system. And, and for whatever reason, she really, because she met me at Fred Siegel and she bought my stuff. So oh, this guy must, to me, I was like still kind of faking it. Yeah. And I got purchased over for like a hundred grand. And wow. so immediately I was like, oh my God, yes. And then about five seconds later, I was like, no, because I was like, how am I going to make a hundred thousand dollar PO? I don't have the money to make a hundred thousand dollar PO. 
So then I just did, which I thought was common sense at the time. I went back to all those friends' houses that I stayed at in high school, like just knocked on the door, door would open. Hey, Bill. Uh, yeah. Hey, do you remember I used to stay at your house when we were in high school? Yeah. I'm all, do you remember I never asked for anything and I was pretty cool? He's like, yes. I go, don't you run a business? Yes, I do. This is their front door. <laughs> Not even a phone call. Just show yeah. I was like, do you know what a purchase order is? He goes, of course I know what a purchase order is. And, and, and these are guys who like ran companies, wealthy guys. Yeah. And I, and I showed him the purchase order. I said, have you ever heard of Urban Outfitters? And they're like, no. And I go, so check it out. He's like, wait a second. Is that $100,000 in orders? Yes. He goes, how'd you get that? I go, let's not talk about that. I need money. <laughs> I was like, would you be willing to finance this and be my partner on it? I was like, I need 50 grand. Just about the cut at that time. Cost 50 to make 100. And he's like, I can't give you 50, but I'll give you 10 grand. So the first door I got 10. And then I immediately realized it was easier to get 10 grand from five people than 50 grand from one person. So mm -hmm. that's rudimentary crowdsourcing. And I just yep. did it with these people that were not anybody with my own family members, just people who had known me as a kid and knew that, hey, he doesn't do drugs. He's just a weird guy. Like what? And, but they all gave me money. And within 60 days, I flipped it, went back of those doors and gave them their 10,000 in cash and then gave them interest on the money. And none of them would take the interest. They were all blown away. They're like, first off, I don't know how you got a PO. They're like, secondly, I thought when I gave him the 10 grand, I'll probably never see it again. Thirdly, the fact that you brought it back and it's in cash in 60 days and you want to give me interest, keep the interest. Good luck. Go do your business. Wow. So that's like how I did it. And then I start, so started moving and I immediately within probably like three months, I got bored. I was like, this is too easy. It's just basic stuff. I was like, I have these other ideas. So I started making more complicated things. And then I thought, well, I'm selling one Fred Siegel. I'll sell. There's another one called Ron Herman. Mm. So people who are listening to this, if you look up Ron, like these are huge fashion places yep. globally. And so I thought, well, I'm selling Fred Siegel. I'll sell Ron Herman. Call them. No answer. Call them. No answer. Left them three messages with my name, who I am. Hey, I'm rolling. I'm selling Fred Siegel. You should give me an appointment. It was basically like dead. Like no answer. Fuck off. I got frustrated. I took a piece of cardboard. I paint. I did a painting on a piece of cardboard and then put my label for my brand on the back and didn't put my name or anything. At that point, I'm like, hey, assholes, you've heard my messages. I know you've heard them. Put it in the mail Thursday, two o'clock. On Friday, I got a phone call from the buyer. Uh, yes, we got a painting here. Who, wh what do you do exactly? I, I'm like, I've left you several calls. We should have a meeting. Went in, got that meeting. And immediately, this is like the construct we have to understand. 1999, people are selling t-shirts then for about $24, you know, yeah. 12 to 24. Yeah. Right. And I was already doing that at Urban Outfitters. And like I said, I was already bored. And I was like, I have this other idea. And so I went to them and I, I brought paintings to the meeting. Like, and I don't know how to do a meeting. I just made it up. Yeah. I brought paintings like the ones behind me. Yeah. And I said, look, I'm going to take these ideas here. And, mm, I and I brought films, art films. Yeah. And if, can I step off camera and grab one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hold on. You'll see. Hold on. So basically, I brought in things like this that are oh. black and white art films. Yeah. You use this to make a t-shirt or art or whatever. Yeah. And so I said, here's my idea. I'm going to use this art with this kind of feeling. I'm going to make you stuff. And the buyer is like, okay, what can you make? And I was like, give me a week. Went home, made a bunch of stuff, brought it back in. And this is like one of the biggest buyers, I mean, globally. Mm. And she's just like... Well, this stuff's amazing. How much is it? And I was like, how much can you sell it for? She's like, I don't know. Maybe we could sell them for like 60 or this or that. And I was like, I was thinking retail is 120. So in 1999, I started selling $120 t-shirts. Each one is one of a kind though. One of one. That was part of my concept, like painting. Mm. So I sold her and it blew out, like blew out crazy. Like, like she, she's like, she's like, Hey, she's like, customers are coming in and they're buying your whole rack. And, and, and then inherently, because it was there, like, then all of a sudden there was like celebrities wearing my stuff, right? Which was weird. Um, and then at that point, I was like juiced on myself. I thought, well, I got, I got Urban Outfitters. Now I got Fred Siegel. Now I got Ron Herman. I was like, Pfft. I called Barney's of New York. Cold called them. Cold. I knew a rep who sold me at Fred Siegel. And I said, look, man, I just need some numbers. I was like, I don't know how to contact these people. And he's like, look, he goes, I think that you're going to be really successful 
just from knowing you the last couple of years. He goes, later on, if you get super successful, he's like, buy me a Land Rover. I'm like, okay, sure. I'm, 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 I'm like two steps from being homeless. I'll buy yeah. you a Land Rover, whatever. <laughs> and he gives me their number and I call up and I'm like, hello. And, and the answers, well, hello, this is Barney's buyer. Yeah, this is Roland Berry. Um, I have a collection at Ron Herman and Fred Siegel. I'd like to show it to you. Oh, okay, cool. When would you like to come? And I was like, when do you have open? Okay, uh, how's January something something? Da, da da da. Okay, perfect. And literally got off the phone, off the phone and had booked a, a, a booked an appointment with Barney's of New York in New York and had never even been in New York before. Right. Yeah. Then not knowing anything, made all my samples. Didn't know anybody in New York. Did fucking Airbnb didn't exist. There's no. I can't look at things on the internet to find a hotel or anything. And I called one friend I had from art school. He's like, hey, don't you have a friend in New York? Yeah, I have a friend who's a photographer. Where does he live? Is it in New York? No, he lives in Brooklyn, but it's close. Can I sleep on his floor? Is that cool? And the guy's like, why do you want to sleep on his floor? I was like, I have an appointment. I don't know where to go. So can I stay there? Flew to New York. Was All I thought was people just getting mugged in New York, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, I'm young. I'm a kid. Yeah. So I had, I had about $800 cash on me. And I, in, and I was like, okay, I'm putting $300 in this shoe. I'm putting $200 in this shoe and put this in my pocket. I was like, this way, you know, if I get robbed, they're not going to take my shoes. Right. Yeah. So I'm literally walking like this because I didn't balance out the, I should have put it equal. Yeah. Lesson. If you're going to hide money in your shoes, <laughs> put it equal. Yeah. Uh, and then the only other thing I knew about New York was traffic from TV. Right. Yeah. So my point was at 10 AM in, in freezing cold January. And I got up at like 4 AM in Brooklyn thought, I don't know how long it's going to take walked out and a cab came right away. And then I was sitting outside the door of Barney's at 5.00 AM. So I had a five hour wait in the freezing cold. Yeah. Right? Just going over my mind, took the stuff up and the buyer was like, okay. And I start, and they gave me like one room. I brought two suitcases with all the samples. They gave me one room. They go, we're going to take you to the big, the big room. Okay. Put it all on the table. And the buyer goes, well, I'm just the buyer for men's because I need to get the, the, over, the overall buyer. Uh, it's kind of the way it works. It's like he was the, the head of uh, co-op for men's Barney's co-op. He yeah. came in um, and he and me was just like, wow, what, where, where did you come from? Where are you from? And I was like, Arkansas. He's like, where did you go to school? I go, I didn't. He goes, how'd you know how to make all this stuff? I go, I'm an artist. And literally through that appointment booked Barney's. So now, so within six months had Urban Outfitters, Ron Herman, Fred Siegel, now Barney's. And then I was like, well, I'm out there. Uh, I'll, I'll, I think I'll go to Philadelphia and I'll, I'll, I'll re-up on Urban Outfitters. They have an office there. And then booked men and women's with Barney's in the same appointment. And that's how I got to like the $500,000 in the first like six or eight months. Yeah. But all done wow. off like, like, I'm here. This is cool. And not even knowing they had never even seen anything like that. And later, th this all is pre-internet, pre-social media. So the weird thing was, like, by 2002, 2003, I was one of the – I'm sitting next to big brands like Alexander McQueen and this brand and Chanel. And, and, and there's my name in Barney's. And I'm like, I'm an independent dude just making stuff. And, I, and the other thing I learned really quickly was – that no one could sell something better than me that was mine. Mm -hmm. And so I would just go into the appointments and I never tried to sell anything. I would just tell stories. And so when I would start telling a story, like obviously I'm, I'm a talker, so yeah, yeah. tell stories about the end time I left. Like, okay, cool. You just booked, you know, $80,000 here and a hundred thousand there. And, da -da. and that's, that's, that's how I started the clothing version of my life. Yeah. How did, how did that uh, transition into, you know, um, you know, art, and being a full-time uh, artist so that it, it did really well and um i did that and then around 2005 i think 2004 i met the guys from lincoln park because they had bought some of my stuff independently and then first i met uh the bassist brad and then i met the dj joe and then i met chester all separately in la mm -hmm. it's like it's that kind of place and they were all like oh we really like your stuff and then I started making stuff specifically for them. Right. And, and I would say, if you go look at their first album cover, they kind of look like skaters. And you look at their second album cover, they met me. <laughs> they look like rock and roll dudes. Yeah. Right. 
And for a while, I was hanging out with him all the time, backstage, going on tours with him, going to it. I was kind of like de facto, not, I'm not going to say member of the band, but it was like, I was there all the time. It was like, yo, we're doing this thing. Hey, we're doing a big shoot. Can you make clothes for it? And they would come and they would bring thousands of garments and the dudes would always just want to wear mine. Mm -hmm. So that catapulted into later me partnering with a couple of guys from Lincoln Park, opening up a store in 2005, did that designed the whole store and in there, and this is like, yeah, 2004, 2004 there I was selling and I was collaborating with other artists that I liked and I was selling limited edition t-shirts on mail. Like, okay, they're 75 to $90 t-shirts. Mm -hmm. So crazy doing well, doing well. And then somewhere Reebok, Reebok was looking to do collaborations with, with, with artists and they kept, asking people who were in the know and my name kept coming up and this guy came to me and goes you know i've talked to like six people and everyone keeps saying roland berry roland berry yeah. like, so who's this roland berry guy <laughs> i'm him got signed to okay this is the important part of the story during that period again i, I just did what i wanted i was making a lot of money and, and and one of my main things was i didn't have anybody to tell me no so if i had an idea i just fucking do it mm -hmm. right i was like and it and the other thing was I was lean and mean and fast. So meaning I could be in a studio, come up with an idea. I could output the film, burn a screen here in, internally, have the sample that night, FedEx the next day, and within two days have a PO. Mm -hmm. So I could move much faster than bigger companies. Yeah. And so because of that, it, the creativity was just flowing and money, 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 blah, blah, blah. And, and when I get money, I, I do cool things. So at that point, I had hired a full-time driver and I dressed him as 1960s Batman. This is real. I have pictures. I'll send them to you afterwards. <laughs> and he would drive me to all these Hollywood parties in my own limo that I bought. So I had my own limo, like 14 person stretch limo. So, so that's the gap, right? 1999 homeless jumping out a window, 2004, had my own limo driving to parties. I would show up to the party. They'd be like, is that your limo? Yes. Is that your Batman? Yes. Uh, come in. So everywhere I went, I would take him with me. Mm. And, and like, if, if I met you, he would frisk you first, mm. like do security. Yep. And he had to stay in character. So when the Reebok people were like, Hey, we're going to, we want to come to LA. And it's like, it was like the 12 heads of Reebok, global heads of Reebok. We're doing a retail tour. That's what corporate people do. And they said, you know, we'd like to meet with you. We're, you know, we're flying in on Thursday. I go, Hey, you know, I'll, I'll have my guy pick you up. Oh, really? Like, yeah. I got a limo. Oh, you do. So I had my Batman pick them up with a sign being like Reebok. And they already they were like, what the fuck? Yeah. Got in the car and it's, it's full of booze, everything, food, whatever they want. And then I call them. I'm, hey, is he get you everything? Yeah, everything's okay. I said, okay, I'll take you to the hotel. They go, okay, tomorrow I want to have a meeting. I go, look, I'm booked tomorrow. I wasn't booked. I'm like, I'm booked tomorrow. I'll meet you for dinner, but you guys can have access to my limo all day. He'll take you on your retail tour. So he took them all around LA in the limo. And they're all getting tossed, right? Which is great for business. And by the time we got to dinner, it wasn't, are you going to sign me? It's like, how much are you going to sign me for? Mm -hmm. There was no, are you going to sign me or not? Yeah. They were just like, this dude is the coolest dude. Like, how does he do all this? They came to my store. They saw my store on Melrose. And at that point, Reebok was like trying to figure out all this stuff. And like, they came in there and they're like, lines of people are buying stuff. And here's the guy from Lincoln Park. And here's this person over here. And they're just like, yeah, okay. So we'll sign you. And they signed me. And again, I didn't know anything about shoes, nothing. And I went from zero and grew that to 27 million, a business with them. And that's 27 million royalty under my designs. And there was probably another 30 million that was non-branded goods that I would still design that just went out the door, but I still got a lower, a lower, a lower royalty to yeah. deal with what they call seepage. You know, it's like, Hey, this looks, it's what Kanye's going like. Kanye's like, Hey, Adidas stole my design. It's like, well, they yeah. didn't steal it. It's called seepage and you're in the company and they don't know what to do. So they're going to make something that looks like yours. It just happens. Yeah. But instead of letting that happen, I was like, look, I'll do a lower one at 5% with no name on it. Um, so yeah. And I brought here in case, there you go. Some of the props. Oh, yeah. Wow. This was 2006. Yeah. And so in 2006, no, but 2005, I got a call from the head of marketing from Reebok. And they said, we're thinking about signing Basquiat. And I was like, Basquiat? 
And this is like beginning of licensing, right? Like Boss gets licensed everywhere now. You, you yeah. go to Target, you can find it. Then it didn't exist. I said, okay, cool. What's the deal? And they're like, ah, he wants, he wants 25. I'm, I'll just tell it. I don't, I'm, I'm not under contract. I can tell you. Yeah. 25,000 a year, uh, a four-year deal. So it'd be like 100 grand up front and uh, I think 15% royalty or something. And I was like, sign him now. I'm like, don't let him leave the office. Sign him. Cut him a check. They're like, really? I'm like, yes, do it, do it, do it, do it. So they sign him with me pushing them. They sign him. I'm busy on a project. I finally come to this project. This is the first, uh, hugely successful shoe for Reebok and for them. And, and we were dealing with Basquiat's dad. Then I met his dad and his dad came in when he saw the product and his dad cried. And his dad's like, this, this is my son. He's like, how did you know how to do this? He goes, you know, how did you, how did you make this? And I was like, look, I was like, I'm an artist. And I got in the mind of Jean-Michel. I was like, mm-hmm. and I respect his work. And I mean, there's, I mean, you can't see, but even on the tongue, let me see if you can get it close. You're not going to be able to see it, but you can see there's a font in here. Yeah. That's, I, met, I went and found all the writing that Jean-Michel had ever written, and I made a font out of his writing. So I could write anything in his, in his own writing, right? Things like that. Um, and then I created, at the time, it's going to sound verbose or, or like I'm gassing you. But at the time, they had never thought of doing shoes like this. Mm-hmm. And because I came from Silkscreen, which is a flat media, and you screen it flat, and their, their factories couldn't even do this. So in order to make this project happen, I had to argue with the creative director of Reebok for three months to get the patterns. I said, look, dude, I need the patterns of the shoes, all size run, so I can program the art flat so you can screen it and then make the shoe. And they were arguing with me. And I'm like, look, I'm not going to go make the fucking shoe. Just give me the stuff. Then once they did it, they still couldn't get it right. So I flew to China and taught the factory how to do it. Wow. And after that, it, it literally changed the way shoes were made. But again, 2006, stuff is still – every. if something was written about you, it would be in uh, Maxim Magazine or Stuff Magazine. So there's those magazines I'm all in, right? Yeah. Because this kind of stuff was coming out. This was – I think I forget what who named it, but it was the number one artist collaboration for that year. And I think these were like 250 a pair. Mm. So that kind of stuff. And then something like this, wow. which if you look at what's happening right now in shoes, this looks very similar to what's happening now. Yeah. Yep. And I took their standard shoe, which was selling for $39.95 at Foot Locker that was black and white. And I said, I want that. They're like, why do you want that? And I, I go, I want the classic. Give me the classic. And I was like, you have to stop selling them black and white. They're like, why are we going to stop selling black and white? I'm, I'm like, because you're, you're bastardizing your brand. I'm like, this is your DNA. Yeah. They gave it to me. I changed a few things subtly. And then I started doing color ups like this. And we were selling these for, so they were retailing them at $39.95. Mine were retailing for $125. Yeah. So it was extremely effective for them. And so I've, I've like when I was there, that's when I learned like how to sp- like corporate speak. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Originally I didn't know how to do that. Yeah. I just knew how to be like, fuck you. We're doing this like art yeah. style. And I had to, I had to realize that that's not the way corporations work. Yeah. So, yeah. But I mean, it was, it was, I learned a lot and I flew all around the world. I, I, I mean, we sold every country in the world and there were like billboards with my names on them, all, all kinds of stuff. But again, yeah. everything before social media. So I was just like a little bit too soon. Yeah. But through that stuff, I uh, learned a lot, learned about, about corporations and learned that most of the time with corporate emails, no matter what the email says, the answer is always sounds good. Let me know. What can, okay. Let me know. What do you need? Anytime I'm here, it's, they don't really want the answer because yeah. in the early, in the early years I gave the answer and I made a lot of enemies. Yeah. I'd be like, your shit sucks. And here's why. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that and then going to the factories and, and, and most people don't understand how shoes work. Uh, a, a brief shoe knowledge. Yeah. In general, Reebok doesn't necessarily, or Nike or Adidas, they don't really pay for the development on a shoe. A factory covers that. And so what happens is all these designers say develop, develop, develop. And at the end, maybe the company, they develop 200 pairs of shoes different styles, but they only end up producing 20 Mm. that puts factories out of business. 
right? Yep. And so I started learning that and I even became friends with factory owners, right? And said, oh, and, and, and started, and, and in my contract, I had the first contract and the second contract. Second contract, I negotiated in the contract, they would cover all travel and that I was, that I would go to the factories twice a year. And they couldn't understand why I want to go to the factories. And I was like, I want to go to the factories so I understand how to make shoes. Because once you understand the construct and how they're working, then you're not designing. I'm not some good designing from LA. I'm designing as if I was in, you know, in China or in Vietnam. And I understand the way the factory works. And yep. once you do that, you can streamline things. Yeah. So. Did, did you, um, so d at a certain point, obviously, I guess, have, how have you managed, you know, artist and designer and have, has it just kind of you flowed based on how things are going or do you well, 50 then, 50 yeah i feel like then i was still very art oriented except every, because i was doing i'm still doing my high-end brand called color and you can google it or look on ebay be like roll and berry color and you'll see people have some of the pieces and like, hey that's a here's a 600 dollars jacket here's a 800 dollars t-shirt very rare that people sell them because people keep them in their collection um so I was still doing that. And that's where I was getting my artistic needs met. But then I also understood the idea of, which I learned really quickly as soon as my royalty checks started coming, like feed the, feed the fucking monster. Mm. I'm like, the monster needs to eat. And if you don't feed it, someone else will. So why don't I just make cool stuff? Um, what else? The, uh, <laughs> the first time I got one of my first royalty checks, it, it was so much that I thought they made a mistake. And I called them and I said, Hi, I think you might have made it because I didn't. It was a lot of money. We're talking a lot of money. And I was like, I feel like you guys need to check this because I was the last thing I wanted was to put like hundreds of thousands of dollars in my bank account and go on a rolling spending spree and then them to say, hey, give that back. Right. Because I was like, this doesn't seem right. It was so large. Um, and the lady got on the phone. She goes, oh, you know, we did make a mistake. She goes, you're, you know, your royalty is 10. She goes, we had it down at 10. It's supposed to be at 50, Mr. Pharrell. So the other person they were doing at the same time was Pharrell and his royalty is 50%. And mine was 10%. Right? And yeah. I was like, she's like, yeah, it was supposed to be like X amount of hundreds of thousands of dollars. You got, you didn't get, I'm like, no, no, no. My name's not Pharrell. I'm rolling. And she goes, Oh, your royalty is correct. That's yeah. That's right. That's the right royalty. You're okay. So if that gives you an idea of how much money is in shoes and then like this shoe landed here, a pair of these landed here in the United States will cost total landed. Everything is like $10 and then everything else goes. And that's where they make all their money and marketing and this and that and whatever. And the issue, not issue, but the reason my collaboration was more profitable is because my, my, my percentage was lower. They were paying me because like the people who are like celebrity, celebrity, like if you get like, like a Kanye or Pharrell, they were also doing Jay-Z's brand at the same time. So when you're doing those brands, they require such a high royalty mm -hmm. that it's like, yeah, that means you have to make 50 times as much volume yep. and then things get diluted. Right. So that's why it was, you know, pretty successful. Yeah. So I guess. But, you I, know, but I feel like I didn't answer your question. I'm yeah. Because you said art. When did art start? Yeah. That all went through. Two, my contract went to like 2011. And, and the Germans, Adidas came in and bought Reebok and that kind of changed the, the flow. And the Germans had different views and I, and I kind of fought back and forth. And I mean, last week I was talking to a business friend of mine who's a, a consultant and we're talking about starting a business and, and he was involved in Reebok too. And he goes, dude, he goes, there's still stories about how difficult you are. He goes, do you really want to do another brand? I'm like, yeah, I think so. He goes, yeah, but you, you can't be like you were then because I would literally go into the board meetings. Well, is the president of Lifestyle they, they had these big corporate uh, gathering meetings. I don't know what they call them, but it's like, it, there's like the 50 global heads from design to marketing and you're all, it's like a retreat, right? Yeah. And then they, they, they said, okay, there's 50 people and there's groups of 10, there's only five groups and you're in charge of a group. They put me in charge of a group and I went over to the, the head and I was like, why am I in charge of the marketing guy? He goes, cause you know what the fuck you're doing. And I, okay. And he was, he's a really raw guy. His name was, his name was uh, Gava was his name. And, and then at the end, after, after three days of, you know, uh, inspiration, you're supposed to present where the company's going to go. 
this year, this year, and this year in the future. What are your ideas? To, where are you going to take the company? Yeah. So everyone gets up and starts going, oh, you know, I'm in a room with everybody. And I looked at him and before he like leaned over me, he goes, he goes, be honest. He's like, he's like, go get him, buddy, which I didn't understand what that meant. So as soon as someone got up, they presented their idea and I raised my hand. I was like, that's horrible. It's not going to fucking work. And I can tell you why. And so that's, how, so that's immediately how I made people who hated me at Reebok. Yeah. yeah. And that was the head of the design's wife. And I didn't know that. <laughs> No, yeah, but I mean, yeah. they're like, oh, we're going to do workwear and we're going to do this and we're going to do this, this, this. I'm like, that, that, that's not on brand. I was like, plus there is workwear. There's this brand and this brand and Carhartt and Dickies. And they're, and they're like, we're going to sell Urban Outfitters. I'm like, no, you're not. I already sell Urban Outfitters. They're not going to buy that. Mm. I'm like, you're wasting millions of dollars. I was like, I can help you. Just don't do it. So that was how I was in meetings. Which yep. I had to bring it down. Yeah. So, but, uh, yeah. yeah. That, that, that was that. And then maybe around 2010, still had some momentum from there and had a lot of money in financing and had built infrastructure internally, had about 15 or 20 employees, was selling, uh, have done, did very, very well in the Japanese market, did really well in the European market and still strong in the US market. Then I think around 2012, there was like the economic crash that kind of happened with everybody. And I thought it skipped me because my stuff was so high profile, which it did technically for a minute. And then there was an earthquake that happened in Tokyo. And when, and when that happened with the, with the radiation spill and all that stuff, uh, the Japanese consumers and every, their, 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 their um, normal setting is conservative. So they went back to conservative, which mm-hmm. meant don't spend anything. Mm-hmm. So let's say at that point I'm doing whatever, a couple million and, and a big chunk of it was from Japan. So I lost that. And then like literally six weeks later, um, someone who was high up in Barney's called me and said, listen, we're going, we're going through a strategic change and it's kind of a reconsolidation of debt. And that's code for you're going to have to go on consignment with us. She's like, but I know you can't because you're you, you know, and so then I lost that account. Those are my anchor, my big anchor account. Mm. So all of a sudden I had 20 employees and, and no real meat accounts to base it off of. And I just watched my account go. <laughs> so about a year and a half, I tried to keep everybody on. And then I got about a year and a half into it. And I kind of set everybody up in a room and I said, Hey, have you assholes not noticed? We haven't shipped anything in a year and a half yeah. <laughs> and I'm paying for everything. And they're like, well, what did you do wrong? I'm like, I didn't do anything wrong. It's the fucking world. I don't know. And so I went from like 15 employees to like 10 to like five to where it was just me. Yeah. Like me and, and, and then I, you know, and, and some of the employees were great and some of them weren't. Um, and then this is what started art. This is the answer to your question. There yeah. had been a graffiti. I had a, a, a huge studio that was probably around, I don't know, 6,000, 7,000 square feet, big warehouse. But mostly I was always doing clothing and, and, and making things along that line. I wasn't, I wasn't painting. And uh, a graffiti guy came from Europe, a famous guy that does, you know, obviously graffiti. And he was doing some big stencils and stuff on my wall. And he said, hey, can I use your space? I said, sure. Let him use my space. And when he left, he left a, a, a giant roll of paper and like one black spray can, which is like this. Yep. And this is a, a spray can that comes from Germany. You can't buy it at Home Depot. I didn't know that. <laughs> And the real story, this is the absolute, I was just sitting there being like, what I was having like the, what the fuck moment. Right. And I was like, dude, you had all this and now you're this. I'm like, you made all this money. Now it's all gone. Like, what do you do? And I was trying to make a decision of keep going. Don't keep going. And I picked up the can. I started sketching on the paper and I was like, Oh, it looked like a face. I was like, Oh yeah. I went to art school. I did figure drawing. Yeah. Pull it down do another one. Oh, and then I did a study of like a chair. Oh, that looks like a chair. Then the can was like, ran out. Yeah. And literally, I was like, this is the universe telling you to make a turn. This is your chance to make a turn. So you can either keep punching against the universe, which is not a good idea, because you can only punch so much before it punches back. Um, so I said, this is my new, this is like 2012, this is 13. I said, the new thing is I'm doing this. And the rest of the story that a lot of people don't know is at that point I paid a welder to come weld the door shut. And I thought I've been in this building for 10 years. I've paid hundred thousand dollars of rent. 
that guy can fuck off for a few months while I'm getting my shit straight. Welded the door shut from the outside. I had a, I had a window in the back that I could crawl out and drop down a roof, which I'd already done that when I was in my twenties. Why can't I do it in my thirties? I can do that. And so the landlord would literally come over banging on the door being like, I'm going to be, and, and, and when you have a corporate lease, it doesn't work like homes where you can stay. It's like you're out and they bring the police, but I like made this big gate and welded it shut where you couldn't get in. And cause I knew I needed time. And I spent six months in the studio by myself, no employees and put it and put big sheets of paper over the wall and did sketches and sketches and sketches and said, I'm going to teach myself a new thing. I'm going to teach myself how to spray paint. I'm going to teach myself how to scale because silk screening has an inherent problem. It's the size. And, and I think the future of whatever I do will be bigger scale. I need another talent. And I made myself not use a paintbrush or a silk screen during that time because I can paint with a paintbrush amazing. But I was like, you have to handicap yourself to grow past it. Did it for six months. Graffiti guy came back, saw my stuff. He goes, who has been in your studio? Who did all this? I'm like, I did it. And literally in that time, I taught myself all the stuff. And wow. went to Home Depot, didn't know where to get spray paint, didn't even think to look it up on the internet bought a ton of spray paint like basically took the last of my money i had said okay pay for a welder pay for some food storage and pay for some paint and that's it now win lose or draw or die this is what you're doing came out of the end of it and then right at that time uh had met somebody that at a party and they're like oh i hear you paint and do this yeah i do this this is what i'm doing right now oh i love that i'd like to buy it i think someone bought my first bought a piece of me for like 15k I think. And so I took, I literally took the 15 K and went and met with the um, landlord in his office. And he was irate, obviously, because he's been trying to get me out for something. <laughs> and he set me on a couch and literally brought his employees by. And when he like cursed at me for like 20 minutes, you're a fucking piece of shit. You're horrible. Da, 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 da. I, so I, I was like, okay, I'll let him go. Let him go. And then let him go for about, you know, 15, 20 minutes, then took the pile of cash out, put it on the table. I said, Either take the fucking money or shut the fuck up. And he took the money. He made me sign a paper or something. Oh, I'll sign whatever you want. Now leave me alone. And then, and then I just kept going from there. I was like, now there's, there's no way forward. And I think there was a, at that point, I still had derivative businesses with um, Neiman Marcus. I, I had orders with Neiman Marcus uh, around 250,000. And the problem was they ordered 250. And at the end of a season, I go, okay, we want to return 70,000 to you. Mm -hmm. And the buyer was really like, yeah, but we're going to back it up and give you another three, 350,000. I had showrooms all over like New York, LA, Paris, like Tokyo. And I was, and, and also still doing urban outfitters and was also doing forever 21. So to give a scope, you got to think this guy was selling Barney's New York, Fred Siegel, Ron Herman, urban outfitters, Bloomingdale's, Neiman Marcus and forever 21, but all different brands. Yeah. Like I would, I would set a turn up here and take advantage of it on the back end, right? Because I, I know the turns. I'm going to set it in the higher end market, right? Yeah, yeah. So my philosophy then was I have to burn the bridge. So I like literally called up um, Neiman Marcus and I was like, hello, this is Roland. Da, da, da. Yeah, I know we have an open PO for 250000 Yeah, I'm canceling that PO. I'm like, you can't do that. Da, da, da. I want to talk to I go, you're talking to him. <laughs> you can't cancel a 250000 You're crazy. I'm like, I'm canceling the order. I'm sorry. Goodbye. Click. Then I can't, uh, urban outfitters, same thing. Click. Uh, I think there was one probably around 500,000 with forever 21 canceled that because we were arguing over 50 cents, some bullshit. And I was like, I don't want to argue anymore. I was like, fuck all this. I'll just be poor. I'll make art. I'll figure it out. But I knew if I kept those, if I kept the little connections going, my fear was I will have a net. I'll have, a, I'll go, well, if it doesn't work out, I can always go back and make clothing designing. Right. I can always go yeah. back. No, no, no. And, um, I thought to myself, fuck all that. I'll burn it down. So I did, I burnt it down and said, okay, there's no way that I can sell these things, these people, anything anymore because they're not going to buy from you because you just fucked up their budget. Right. And I said, that's it. Now you're doing your painting. And since 2013, 14 full time, that's what I've been doing. And I still do consulting where I consult with, but, but nowadays I only work with or help brands or consult with people that, that I want to, like, I have to like them. Yeah. They'll like come and present something to me and I'll be like, mm, that doesn't sound like me. 
I don't want to do it. It doesn't matter what the money, the, the, it just doesn't sound like it goes to my energy or whatever. So I just changed. And I think around, yeah, around 2013, I, I had a younger brother. He passed away. And when that happened, at the same time, I had a, I had partnered with a Chinese company, started a brand, and we went from zero to like five million in like a year. And I owned what 25% of the company or whatever. And we were coming back from a lunch and I just said, pull a car over. They're like, what? I was like, pull a car over. And I just got out of the car. And I'm like, see you guys later. And they're like, what? And I don't think Uber was working. Because I remember I walked a long way. And then I think I saw a cab and took a cab back to my studio. And they came banging on the door, like, let us in, let us in, let us in. And I just told them, hey, I'm, I'm fucking out. Like, I'm done. I don't, I don't want to play any more games. I don't want to play any more, you know, bullshit. So it, it just was like a determining factor. So again, trajectory, like there was trajectory, like my brother's passing away made me really think of things. And I thought, why are you going to waste your life doing stuff you don't want to do with people you don't like? Mm. So I walked away from that company because I, I would have had to fight, you know, I w- would have had to go through like, you know, court and battle for this and that. And, and I was like, in the end, they're a Chinese company. They're going to do whatever they want. And, and I don't care. Let them go do whatever they want and shut it down. So, and that's, the landscape of how I got to, Hey, I'm going to paint. Yeah. And maybe I missed the section, which was like late nineties. I did a lot of wheat pasting just inherently. Cause that's what I wanted to do. At that time it was really me and another artist who a lot of people know named Shepard Ferry. He's the guy who did the uh, obey stuff and the hope poster. And he and I were the only people doing like wheat pasting. And that's how I knew him. Cause he called me. He's like, who are you? You know, this guy. And, and that's my, my street art name was color mm. because then I was doing, full color silk screens and, and wheat pasting where, where most people were photocopying stuff at, you know, Kinko's and then wheat pasting it. Yeah. Why a lot of early street art was black and white. Um, but mine was color. So I named it color. And I, I like, obviously I like color. Yeah. Um, so around 13, I kind of just was like, well, it worked before it could work again. And now I'm doing these giant sketches that are five feet wide by eight feet tall. Why not wheat paste them up? So went in the street and would just we paste my sketches up and write color. And then eventually that drove them to, uh, and I had an assistant who was helping me do it. And this is a kid who would come in like, you know, two days a week. And he's like, you should start an Instagram. You should start an Instagram. I'm like, nah, that's for like people who want to show what they eat. And that's for like kids and like dumb people. And then, and I, cause I'm, I'm not communicative in that way. It's kind of anti-technology. And he said, no, you should start one. And I started one, went to bed and woke up the next day and had like 500 followers. Woke up the next day, I had 1,500 followers. So back then, the algorithm worked because people yeah. saw my work, they followed me. But then, they obviously, they changed all of that. So <laughs> there's, yeah. it's like pay to play. Yeah. But um, and that's that's how I've I've worked, and I'm, I've had galleries represent me. I've had I've done a bunch of solo shows. I've shown in Miami, in New York, and in Tokyo, um, all kinds of things. And the reason we're here now, my big studio that I built was somewhere around, I think, 2017. Around 2017, I built this place because I was like, the best thing to do is to make a studio so big and then it is a gallery. And then the same thing, I'm all in. So I reinvested everything and just built my own gallery. So when people come here and they see massive paintings and they see everything, they're not like, oh, I bet this guy sells a painting for like 300 bucks. So I just, I just created the world. I'm like, this is the world. So when you... Like if you were here in LA, that's why when we started talking, I'm like, where are you? You want to come here and do it here? Because if you're here, you, you understand everything in a scale. Yep. Yep. Like you guys are only seeing like, I mean, you can't even see. It's just, there's so much stuff. And, yep. and these are, I mean, that is a five by five uh, Warhol subscreen. Even the scale of doing a silk screen that size is hard to do. But yeah, so that is kind of the trajectory in a very bite-sized version. Yeah. How do you how do you know uh, like like when you're done with a piece like because is that is that a hard process? Cause especially I, with I work so until something doesn't bother me. Like I'll go and I'll go and I'll go, and, and sometimes I'll I'll paint until five in the morning, six in the morning. That's why I was like, hey, I'm better in the afternoon because my my brain doesn't work in the morning because yeah. it's, it's it's I've been that way since I was a kid. Like I was shit in the morning, but in the afternoon I start waking up. Um, I go until, uh, and again, you have to remember I was 
I went to art school. So I studied figure drawing. I started abstraction, art history, um, everything like, like in, in, in all the basis of, of being like an actual artist. Right. And so through that, it's like, it's like you learn composition. Right. And it's like, so what I, I, I look at it and look at it and, and wherever my eye goes, if it's unsolved, I'll solve that area. And then as soon as I feel that area solved, I'll solve this. And I'm, I mean, if you were here and we we're in person, I would take you from one of my paintings. You'd say, oh, this is a painting of a horse or a buffalo or whatever. And I'd say, no, it's not that. What it really is, is an abstract painting with something on top of it that your brain can identify. And you identify the horse, but now I'm using abstract and I'm moving you through the painting. So I just kind of look at, I look for like impedance, I guess is the right word, in the painting and watch the flow. And I'll say, okay, everything's good. Or I'll challenge myself to make it to a certain level. I'll say, I want this. And when it's done, it's done. And sometimes those, I'll do things that, I don't know, took too much time. And then I'll just go, we paste it up anyways. I'm like, okay, it's on paper. Who cares? So that was, I think that was another thing that made it, a lot of artists stand in front of a canvas and they get intimidated and they're like, what am I going to do? Oh, this is canvas. Oh, I'm going to think about it. Let me think about this. Let me, let me have a cigarette. Let me think, let me get, they're in love with the, the modality of being the artist and being tortured. I'm in love with t- channeling what's inside of me and projecting it onto a surface, right? And, yep. and the process. So w- when I go, I, I go like a, a fucking chainsaw. Like there's no, there's no, not a lot of thinking because I've already thought about it for six months or a year in my head. Like, and I'll, so continually I'm working out paintings in my mind that I've never made, right? But then because a background in, in clothing and in t-shirt and in, and in also in clothing or in shoes. Like if I show you this and if I pick the colors and, and the size and whatever, and then I deliver it to you and if it's not within tolerance, they return it. It's just standard. Right. Yeah. So I'm more exacting. It looks like what I'm doing is kind of like, Oh, he's just throwing paint. Da, 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 da. But I'm like, no, it has to look like this. So a lot of times if I do a commission for someone, um, They'll say, oh, I want it to look like this, or I'll photograph them and do a painting, and I show them a digital comp, and it, when we're done, I'll send you some so you can, yeah. you can see them. But it's like, here's a digital comp, and here's the real version. You're like, dude, it's, it's better than the digital comp, because I work in that way, like yeah. it, it, in an exacting fashion. Does that make yeah. sense? Or yeah, yeah. Oh, there's, there's something in the painting where I'm like, you know, it, I want it to arc, and I want it to come this way. I'll keep doing it until I get it right, and I'll say this, now it's right. Now the flow is right. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's just, that's how I feel. And also I have a thing where a lot of people who end up collecting my work, a lot of times we become close or they're like, Hey, invite me to their house and they'll have a party or whatever. And if I go to their house and if I saw something that was wrong in the painting, it would drive me insane. So I was like, I'll, I'll I've had to call people and say, Hey, your painting was supposed to be in December. It's looking like it's going to be February. And they'll be like, why February? I'm like, because it's part I haven't solved yet. And the good people are like, take your time. I trust you. And the bad people are like, I want my painting. Mm. So, and you know, that's, it's just my, I try to match my abilities at the, my mantra is make the best thing you can possibly make at the time with the skills you have. Don't do anything less. Yeah. So every day I get better at what I do because I practice. Right. So that means the painting I did, the painting I'm going to do in 2022 is better than the painting I did in 2017. Inherently by doing it more. But yeah. yeah, do do you think about validation or, you know, obviously, you know, the audience is so important in art and, you know, there's gallery representation and, they, you know, you have to worry a little bit in some sense about reaction. Do you do you think about that? When I don't think your- about that too much. And the reason yeah. why is because. OK, I left the clothing business because I was like, it's it's. Dude, it's horrible. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's a very hard business and people are unsavory and people aren't honest. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, whatever. It's, it's, it's a hard business. Clothing is a hard business. And uh, I left that. And then I was like, oh, I'll go do art. And then as soon as I got into the art business, I, the business of art is a hundred times worse than the clothing business because there's no fucking rules. There's no rules. It's like, uh, it's, it's all, it's subjective. It's like, it's like, cool. This is someone's painting. Okay, it's worth 100 million. Why is it worth 100 million? Because I say so. 
And if the right person says so, it's worth a hundred million. Yeah. Right. And if not, if this was the thing that I just dipped my paint in. So it's so subjective and there's so many tricks to the art stuff that, that the outside people don't know or don't understand. And I, I think art is art and painting is probably the most ethereal and, it, and it's something that can, something can be nothing and something can be everything. And it's all about who signs off on that. So that's, I would probably say that's probably why I'm not more successful because I don't buy into that. I'm like, it is what it is. Like, and I, and I, and I don't inflate prices and I don't, I mean, the games that people play in art is, are insane, mm. but you're on the outside or people on the outside. So they don't know it. Right. And then, and then, and plus people buy art. Mo some people buy art for investment. Some people buy art because, Hey, I, I I went to the Grand Canyon and I want a picture of the Grand Canyon on my wall. So I remember my vacation, right? Okay, cool. That's cool. I'm glad you have that. And they, they, they buy that way. And then other people buy off of when I look at this, there's an emotional response and I feel something. That's usually what I, that's, that's my zone. Right. Yeah. And, and there's, everything has, there's, it's like the wizard of Oz. Art is like the wizard of Oz. It's like behind the curtain. You know, there's someone going like this, you know, from people driving markets that don't exist to people inflating things to people. And, you know, and, and it, it, it's just like stocks. Real art is just like stocks, except there is no rules. Mm. That's it. So if you have the right person representing you, like I have literally been in rooms and seen an art agent be like, OK, this is 40,000. And he'll call someone and say, hey. Right now it's 60. I'll give it to your 50. He'll make another call and go from, from 60 to 75 and say, look, they're doing 65, but I can, I can get you in right now at 75. By the end of the phone call, he's at a hundred thousand. So that's, that is the, the up and downside of art. Right. And so either you plug in the systems and I don't know if you got this from speaking to me, but I'm very much, uh, I don't give a fuck. I do what I want. Straightforward, direct. And, yeah. and a lot of times art is about who you align yourself with. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot 100%. of games of yeah. like who you align yourself with, who you sit next to, who you dote on relationships, you, relationships. And yeah. even if there's someone's art, you don't like, you have to pretend like you like it and all that. And I, I'm, I'm just like, I don't have time for that shit. Yeah. So I, I survive on the merit of the work. And I always tell them, I'm like, people are like, oh yeah, this is great. Maybe it's going to be valuable in, in the future. I go, I don't know. I can't tell you if it's going to be valuable in the future. If you like it, buy it. If you don't like it, don't buy it. I, I don't know what to tell you. That's it. I don't, I don't, I don't sell the dream of, hey, one, one day this is going to be worth millions of dollars. It might be, might not be, but you should be happy with what's on your wall. Yeah. Do you ever um, lose, like, you know, because, because it is, your work and it is how you pay your bills and stuff like like does is it hard to balance sometimes the love like of your passion versus the practicality of you know i need things you know to be like i don't know if that makes sense does that ever yes yes, yes that totally makes sense um i always most of the time i'm, I'm doing what i want to do to be honest mm -hmm. and most of the time people who by the work, by work that I've already created or, or they allow me the freedom that I need. And sometimes you get people who, you know, are skeptical or a little worried or this or that, or, and, and there's ups and downs like everything, but I do not take for granted the fact that I have not had a job since I was 24 years old. Right. Like I haven't worked for any, I, I just, just, like when I was 24, I was like, I'm not working for anybody anymore. That's it. I was like the rest of my life, let's go, whatever happens. So I, the amount of free time I have, right. The amount of time I have to think, to figure things out that, you know, I have all the time in the world, you know, and all the projects I want to do in the world. So it's th the main thing is just like, how do I finance the project? So a lot of times it'll be something big that I want to do. And I got to figure out how to finance that or I have to finance, you know, the ins and outs of living. But the other thing I would say is upside to social media and the internet and everything. I, I can rattle off 20 people to you that I know personally that are all making two to $10 million a year from art. We're like, if we, if we tracked back to 2000, or you back to the eighties, the seventies, the idea was like, Oh, there's only certain artists that make money, but the internet opened all that up. 
right? And it, so that that part is good about the internet. It, it opened it up so that a lot more people can make a lot of money because there are a lot of consumers. So you have people consuming at different levels. Yeah. So I, I think it's just, and I always, um, I always try to make something that resonates with me. The the creativity of of your work, you know, um, like I saw blown away with you know, which is Elvis and Marilyn. You know, is is that something that just natural to you, or do you are you constantly brainstorming just different ideas, and then you pick out um, the best ones, or how, how's the creativity of? So a lot of times I have I have books by my desk, and as I'm reading, I read a lot of things, or I look at things, or inspiration, or whatever, and 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 I'll make notes, and, so, and sometimes they're you know no, notes about hey, what's going on in the world, or what's happening now, or what's happening, or words that I like, or things, and a lot of times I'll have I'll I'll start seeing something in my mind, and and with that particular one, right? I, there's always the challenge. So there's two ways to make an image of Marilyn Monroe or Elvis, right? You would either have to make it unsanctioned and you say, here's Elvis. And then if you make enough of them, they're going to come sue you, right? Here's Marilyn, make enough of them. They're going to come sue you because everyone owns the images of everybody. Yeah. And I, and so a lot, and all this, a lot of times I'll try to make something that didn't ever exist, right? That is inherently mine. It's like, that's inherently mine. That it never existed. And, and like, I remember the night I, did that and when I first came to the idea for it, like I sketched it and I thought about it. I started making it in the computer and I was just like, it was like four in the morning and I started like basically dancing on the studio because I realized I had made something that never exists, which is hard to do. Um, and also I think, again, one of my advantages is integrating technology, right? So if I have an idea, I, I'll sketch it out normal and then I'll say, okay, now I got that. Now I'm going to take that, put it in Photoshop, work on it bring that out, look at it again, draw on top of it. So I go through steps. So I have the ability to move quickly. And, and like I said earlier, from, from being like this, when I have an idea, I just go. And, and the other thing is I realized for me to be effective, I not only need to have a big space, I need to have everything I could possibly want in the big space to work with and also have no excuses. I have no excuse not to make art. I can't think of one, Right. And I also don't have an excuse to be unhappy or sad because I'm like, well, if, if you're unhappy or sad, go fix it. Let's fix it. We'll keep it. It's like you just and, and that's where that's my sweet spot. That's that's where I've been able to um, support myself and overcome and and get over creative this or that or whatever. But I've never been like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do or what about this or what about that. And and when I have people who come here and a lot of times collectors come and I, I give talks and stuff like that. Not, not a big talk. I mean, I've given big talks to thousands of people, but talking to like 10 people that are here, I'll, I'll talk to them. And usually I'll do a thing where I'll take in the middle of talking, I'll make sure I pick up something and I throw it to someone and they catch it. And then I say, that's art. You didn't think you caught it. Art is like being an athlete. It's, it's like, it's, it's like, yes. Is Colby Bryant amazing? Or was he amazing? Yes. Was Michael Jordan amazing? Yes. You know, whatever athlete you want to pick. But they're that amazing because they train and train and train and train. And by the time they get on the court, they're not thinking like, all right, I'm going to block this guy. I'm going to turn around and do this. I'm gonna do There's no thinking. It's instinctive, like on an animal level. So that's that's how I try to work. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, 100%. And that, and that keeps – it keeps me from – I don't get blocked because – I'm, I'm, I'm flowing. I'll get into my flow. And then a lot of times if I'm not quite in my flow, I have a practice where I allow myself to play before I start something. I'll go, okay, you want to start painting tonight at eight o'clock around six, you can start playing whatever you want to play with, make silly pictures, find something funny on the internet, make something silly, do something that doesn't make sense. Photoshop something crazy, whatever it is, play. And then through the play, it loosens my brain up and I trick my brain into being like, now you're going to work. So my work is play, but I kind of access it through play, right? Like I'm always in the studio. I'm always playing, like doing silly things or drawing weird stuff or, and that's the trick. So I, I'm never really going to work to paint. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Like I'm not, I'm like, Oh, I got this commission or I have this big painting I'm working on. I have to get it done. No, you don't have to get it done. It'd be good if you got it done, but why don't you go play? And, and some of my play equals, going to nature. Some of my play equals reading books. Some of my play equals 
watching a podcast. So it's just wherever I want to play and then I get ideas or I read things or whatever, and then sketch and play and allowing yourself to play and saying, you can do whatever you want through that creativity just opens up my vortex. And then I can, then I create. You know, when you're doing collaborations with like Aston Martin or, you know, making clothing for Billy Idol or the, you know, Lincoln Park or whoever it is, you know, how does the 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 other brand or the other person, you know, you know who they are, their celebrity value, you know, how do you not get intimidated if maybe they're asking for a commission or how do you oh. stay true, you know, to your self or the art or the design and, you know, because that can be nerve wracking. I'm sure the first time you ever did it for a celebrity, you know, it was nerve wracking because you're you're wondering if they'll like you and you want, you know, them to continue to come to you. And um, sure, sure, sure. I think I think and, and to Fred Siegel's credit, I would work there in the beginning. You know, it's, it's OK. Um, you know. Uh, she, OK, biggest stars in the world will come in. You know, it's, it's like uh, here's Julia Roberts and I'm working with Julia Roberts one on one being like, let me fit these jeans on. You. Here's Cindy Crawford. Here's, uh, you know, Jeremy, Jeremy Piven. Uh, what's his name? Iron Man, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, right. Uh, it's like, yeah. So it's like once I got that and I kind of became comfortable with that. And then what I, the weird thing was once I had a studio and people started coming, I realized when they came that we were on the equal plateau. Right. And so that's also why I, and, and it, had I done it, it would have been smarter. If I, every time I was next to like Lincoln Park, if I took a picture and pointed, then I could use it as social credit, right? Later on, like, okay, like just band wise. Well, wait, I'll give you my U2 story. Cool. In high school, didn't have money. Told you I, I was like living at friend's house, had a girlfriend. U2 came to play, didn't have the money to take her. So I only had the money to pay for parking to go in Dodger Stadium to listen to it from Dodger Stadium sitting in the parking lot. That was the best I could do. Mm. 10 years later, got a phone call. Hello, this is so-and-so calling from U2. But I'm like, ha, ha, ha hung up hello this is someone the stylist for you too have hung up third time she called me hello this is so-and-so calling for me too. and i go wait is this real yes we bought your stuff we bought it at, um i was selling in london i think selvages or something yeah we saw, bought your stuff at selvages bought your stuff at ron herman and we got your name we really like your stuff would you be willing to help make some stuff for bono and the edge like are you fucking kidding me yeah i'm in so Within 10 years, not only did I make stuff for them, but like I, then when they played at Staples Center or whatever, like I'm literally on stage with a talent pass with them. Like that's how crazy my life has been. So, so it's like as big as someone wants to be or as small as someone wants to be, I, I just realized it's like we're all super creative. And then it, it never really got to me. I don't, and I, I just say, it, you know, and the other thing is um, I don't believe in deflectors. Meaning if you're so-and-so and you're a celebrity and someone comes to me and they want me to make you something, I'm not going to talk to your assistant. I'm not going to speak to your stylist. I'm not going to talk to the assistant assistant this. I'm not going to make something for free and then send it and hope they get it. Fuck all of that noise. I Very early on, I said to everybody, you celebrity, musician, like whatever. I'm like, cool, I'll make you this. Here's what I think it's going to cost. If they want it for free, I'll be like, cool. Then come to my studio and do a set for free. Yeah. They're going to be like, well, I can't do that. And I said, cool. Then we're on the same page. <laughs> and, and again, it's, and it's always a direct communication between me and the artist, whoever it is, it, it, because that's, that's, that's where the sweet spot is because they understand me and I understand them with, I have a, I've had a long, long, long relationship with Billy Idol, uh, somewhere around, 2006 i think i was in new york walking down it was freezing i look homeless which is kind of my vibe all the time anyways because i don't care and i'm going down broadway with a friend of mine and it's freezing i'm all camoed out beanie beard and i see a jacket that i made which is rare for me because these jackets you have to understand in a season i would only make 200 jackets each one's one of a kind the retail is like 2500 dollars. seeing one of those is like seeing a fucking unicorn you don't see them Yep. I don't know who buys them, but somebody buys them. Yep. 
all of a sudden saw a jacket and I was like, went up to it and I was like, Hey, and I'm pointing at the jacket. And I was like, that's my jacket. And I look and it's like, Oh, you're Billy Idol. Hey. And at that point, his security jump on me. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 no. That's my jacket. Like, check it out. Check it out. Look at the back. Look at the back. And they're like, they're like, all pushing me back and holding me back. And they're freaking out because they think I'm like some obsessed fan. And I'm just like, fuck the fan thing. You're wearing my jacket, dude. And then at the, they usher him in the SUV. And I'm like, I'm like, when you get to LA, look at the back label. It says Roland Barry. I'm Roland. Find me. And then like three months later, I got a phone call. Hey, we like your stuff. Can you work with Billy? And then that's how my relationship started with him. And then now it's like, he's texting me. Hey, I'm doing this. Would, do you want to make some stuff? Yeah, sure. I go to his house directly. I speak to him at his house. I fit him in his house. That's it. There's no, <laughs> there's, that's it. It's as simple yeah. as it could possibly be. So th- those, and, and that's when I say like, I have like a million stories and they're all kind of like that. Like these things that just like opened up right place, right time and directness and no, uh, there's no scam in what I do. Right. It's not, I'm not trumping it up or, you know, inflating it or whatever. I'm like, I'm like, cool, check it out. You want a one of a kind jacket made for you that exactly fits your body. And it has, you know, uh, 3000 to 6,000 hand placed studs. Okay. I can make that. And then I do. That's it. Yeah. How do, you, how do you think about your art style? Like I, I notice a lot is portraits. You know, did you experiment with that or no, I'm you know, in the future? Do you think, you know, do you ever think you'll do landscapes or like, how, how do you think about that? Yes, I do. Well, actually the weird thing is I'm, I'm really just an abstract artist. I, it's more on the pop side because that goes back to feed the monster a little bit. It's easier for people to understand, but I'm much more of a, culture abstract artist, a, a really good abstract artist. And it, it just depends on where my flow is at the time. Right. And then I have some bigger paintings where I want to move more towards abstract. And, and sometimes it goes back to, do I like it? Like, I have to like it. Like it's a, a cool, uh, I'm, you can't see it. I'm looking at a, um, uh, a, a David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust painting. It's on the wall right here. And I made that because I love fucking David Bowie. That was it. I didn't make yeah. sell it. I because hey, his music carried me through some crazy shit. Cool. I like I like it. I like the 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 imagery. I like what it symbolized. Like all that stuff. And when when he passed away, there was a gallery in LA, and I won't say their name. And they like called me, and they knew that I did that. They're like, hey, you have a bunch of Bowie stuff, right? I'm like, yeah. They're like, bring it in. We can. It's 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 on fire right now because he died. Um, we can sell it for a whole bunch of money. And then I was like, no. I was like, that seems weird to me. Mm. So when I make stuff, especially if it's something like that, uh, if I make if I make something that's a Jimi Hendrix thing, I try to make something that if Jimmy was here, he would see it and be like, I fucking love it. Mm. I don't make it to sell it. I make it f- from the from the guy who actually enjoys Jimi Hendrix music or enjoys you know the Rolling Stones or enjoy whatever it is. What it, so that's that's where the pop side comes from because I'm influenced that from the culture where I grew up, right? The, the, those the music absolutely influenced me so um that's where that iconography comes from yeah um yeah so i i guess you know as we look at the time i, I guess for for you if there's someone that's looking to start out in you know becoming a designer or an artist um obviously you've given a lot of great stories is is there one piece of advice that you know, you'd give to someone that may be struggling with, you know, um, belief or continuing with the journey or, you know, um, anything like that. Okay. I've, I'll, I'll answer it separately because I think they're a bit different. Yeah. I think if you're starting design and doing that stuff, everything works different. now. You don't, the, the construct of, I'm going to start a brand. I'm going to invest all this money. I'm going to go do runway. I'm going to be in Paris. Everyone's going to know my name. That's one construct. It's kind of an old one. Hey, I'm going to be in these stores, brick and mortar. They're going to sell it. And Now you can have just as much steam and just as much fuel building a small, tight network and selling directly to a consumer. And the idea that I, that I would tell them is one, don't listen to anybody if they tell you you can't do it. 
because people told me that people told me my whole life can't do it can't do it can't. it's like if you really want to do it do it one number two take it serious and and really try to do it don't make shit stuff don't make shit stuff and try to sell it because it, it, cool your brand's going to go like this and it's going to go like that. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen. Cool. You'll get some success. People, you'll blow up a little bit. People will know about it. Your friends will know about it. Everybody wearing that one hat at the party and it, you'll feel really cool, but your brand's going to go like this and go like this because it will become non-relevant and invest your time in making things that, that you want to make because you're the consumer that that helps. And then also use all the technology that you can, you know, from direct to garment to, you know, digital production to, there's all these tools that you have now, especially since COVID, that have developed that if you will invest your time in, you can, you can make the brand that you want to have. And then after that, it's like the marketing side of it. Where's, where's your marketing? Like, you know, who are you going to market it to and that stuff? But I mean, there's, there's tons and tons of brands that are making millions and millions of dollars that aren't being sold in a Bloomingdale's, a Barney's or an Urban Outfitters mm. because that construct is such a bigger thing. And also, even when you look at now with like supply chains and making things in China or Bangladesh or wherever you're going to make it, or if you're making Portugal, it's going to be leather. Great. Wherever you want to do it, it still takes time and it's lag. And I, and I think fashion now is like, bam, it's like, I want it now. I want it now. It's like, whatever's happening today, give it to me today because I'm going to wear it tomorrow and then I'm going to be on to something else. So you figure out that cycle and, and how to, how to move down that road. I mean, so closet closure, box of what I would say is do it, do what you really want to do that you believe in and do it because you believe in it, not because you want to ball out of control. You can yeah. ball out of control later if you really put your belief into it. And it, it you know what I mean? Yeah. That will happen, but do it because you're like, this is what I am. This is what I am. And th those things, people get the DNA of someone really quick, right? That, that really happens. Um, art, different story. Okay. Art is, you are in the ocean. You are by yourself. You don't have a raft. You don't have anything. You don't know where the land is. You have no clue. Where's the land? I don't fucking know. It is your job as an artist to not die, one. And two, start moving in a direction. Even if it's the wrong direction, start moving. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving which means keep producing work, whatever you're going to produce. I don't care if you're bending spoons or using popsicle sticks. If that's your thing, that's your thing. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. And as you keep moving, eventually someone's going to come alongside you. Maybe at first it's a dolphin. The dolphin's going to say, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to tome a little bit. You get a little bit of, someone will start coming to support you, right? A dolphin, because it's funny. Um, maybe some people come in a boat and you're going to see a big yacht and everyone's going to be bawling out of control. And they're going to say, yeah, man, what's up? What's up? They're not going to help you. They're going to ball out of control and send a wake your way. And you think you're getting on the boat, but you're not unless you really figured out how to get on the boat. Otherwise you're still in the ocean by yourself. Mm -hmm. And at times it feels like you're lost, but you have to keep going, keep going, keep going. And all of a sudden it goes from, you'll, you'll, you'll start having belief in yourself. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh, wait, wait, I have a life preserver. Okay. I don't have to work so hard, but I can still go a little bit. Oh, wait. Hey, these guys came by. Here's a boat. Now I got a boat. Now I'm moving. I'm moving. And what happens is you start supporting yourself with the people around you, right? And, and I don't mean hang out with dumb people to make yourself feel good. I mean, people who really want to push you forward and who believe in you. And they, and they cannot swim for you. They can't breathe for you. They can't take you to shore, but they can help you a little bit, right? Early collectors, whatever that is. And then sooner or later, you'll start saying, holy shit, I think that's land. And then you just keep going. And once you get to land, then you got it figured out. And then you start, then you start your, then you, then your real building of the artist starts, right? Who am I really? But that's, that's why people get lost in art. That's why people, you know, sink, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm out here by myself and what am I doing? I'm, I don't know. No one's here in hell. Because the, the reality is it's your job as the artist to go through that process. And, and part of it being lost is okay. Right. And, and there is no, there's no fair in art, Right. Because some guy is going to come and he, he's going to make lesser work than you. But because he figured something out that you didn't figure out, he's further than you. And there's someone who's going to make work that's way better than you that is literally in the middle of the ocean sinking because they can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. So there's no fair. So you have to divorce yourself from that and, and divorce yourself from comparing. 
to other people because that'll drive you crazy. It's like just, just narrow and focus. I mean, I do think I'll take this out of like a hip hop book. I do think it's good to know who's doing stuff that you want to do stuff, ascend, you know, excel to and say, this person's doing this, this, that's the direction I want to go have a goal, but don't go copy them. Right. Because there's tons and tons of derivative art. And anybody who's a real collector who really knows stuff, immediately they know it's derivative art. They're like, okay, that's a Basquiat. That's a Warhol. This is a Keith Haring. This is a, and it's like, well, that's derivative. So then you get to like, now I have to make something original, right? And it's like, how do I do that and not turn into, you know, uh, something completely, you know, blobs of paint on a wall. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. But that's a, that's, that's a lot of swimming, right? Or you have to have the channels to get there. And, and I think that, again, right now, you have the most amount of opportunity to excel through a digital format, right? Like what we're doing, yep. right? like this communication. And through that, you can figure out, you can figure out a way. And, and I, th- I think uh, all the goofy shortcuts, I feel like those don't work, to be honest. Like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get it on this person and I'm going to paint this person or, or or I'm a hot chick and I'm going to, you know, show my boobs and that's going to make people like me more and people buy my paintings. And it's like, don't, don't base your work off that. Just make good work. And, and, and again, you have to keep going. I have to keep going. And I have several friends. I have ups and downs. I have several friends who are like, well, you know, are you ever going to just quit painting and just like go get a job, be a creative director and do all these things? And I was like, no, man, that would kill me. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do that. I, I would rather just do this and have freedom. Yeah. So I, mean, I think those are my two design versus that, you know? And I mean, like if you and I were inclined to start a shoe company within a month of planning, we could start a shoe company, sell it direct to consumer. We could yeah. do it. With technology, because yeah. it's like all the factories are there. It's like, yeah, it requires finance. Okay, that, then you got to work for it, right? And that means someone, that's those people who have to get around you and kind of push you forward. Yeah. So, yeah. And my, 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 with me, I always thought if I can get one person to believe in me, I can magnify that and I can go where I need to go. So then I get one person, two people, three people, four people, and I just keep, keep moving, keep moving. Yeah. Now the next video will be when I'm you're filming me. I'm in the alley and I'm homeless. But that's that's another video. Yeah, just kidding. Sounds good. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I I just we Roland we talked about a lot, and um, you know, as we look to conclude, is is there anything else that um you wish we had talked about, or any piece of life advice that you'd want to to give, or anything like that? Hmm. I don't, I, I mean, I, I feel like that. I feel like if you do something like it, it doesn't matter if you're like a kid making your beats right on your computer, if you're in it and you're really making them, people will recognize it. It's your job as the artist to get it to where people can recognize it. Right. And so that was part of what I thought when I was like young, I was like, I don't have a gallery. I don't have this. I don't have that. Blah, blah, blah. Poor me. I'm like, how can I get people to see my art? Okay, well, I'm just going to make the art. I'm going to put it in the street and then someone sees it or doesn't see it, right? And then, so that at that point, that was my best idea, right? Now there's other, you know, obviously there's other ways to do it now. But I, I think it's like, you just have to figure out how to get it to where people will see it and then it resonates. But, and I mean, there is, the, the, oh, there is an ocean of art being made. It's crazy how much art's being made. And everybody picks on different things. And, and I try to, I try to not capitalize on current affairs, right? It's like, if someone, um, let, let, let's pretend uh, the moon's going to explode. And everyone starts making art about the moon exploding. Oh my God, I can't believe the moon's exploding. It's like, I'm not going to do that because that there's no longevity in that, right? Because this week it's the moon. Next next week there's aliens that showed up in Australia. It's like, am I going to make artwork about that? No. So it's like, but there are people who do that. So you'll you'll see artists who jump from theme to theme to theme to theme. But the people, I mean, if you analyze art, the people who are successful are like this. It's this, right? And they they figure out their lane and they go, and it takes time. Anytime you see this, or you see this, or, or a spike up, you immediately know it's 
artificially inflated or that it's going to drop. It's, it's, it's very similar to like money and finance. Yeah. It's like when you see things going like this, you're like, okay, that's a problem because it's going to go like this. It has to. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. I don't know. I don't, and I don't know. I don't know who the next boss scout is. I don't know who the next Warhol is. There obviously will be one eventually because you'll, there's only so many of those things that exist. And, um, but, but I think in the end, it's like, don't make art trying to be that. Just make art that you like and then find people who like it and then, you know, carve out your living, whatever it is. I know people who live on native reservations and they make these little things. That's how they make their life and they're happy. Right. So there's like a, I, I try to find that spot where it's like, I'm not, I'm not uh, bastardizing what I want to do, but I'm also giving a little bit and, and, and still making within my bumpers. Yeah. Well, Roland, I just want to thank you. It was really cool to, to you know, get to s hear the personal and the professional side. Um, you know, obviously you can uh, look up, you know, what what you mean to the design world and art world, but to hear all the stories, uh, that was that was awesome. Uh, if, if anybody wants to support you, uh, what's the best way to do that? Um, I'm really communicative on my Instagram. They can just go on my Instagram say hello, say what's up. Uh, I don't really have a YouTube or anything like that. I'm, I'm, I'm behind on that. Um, but that, I mean, I get, I, people send me tons of messages on Facebook and like, I never go on there. Right. And I'll go on there and it'll be like, Oh, three years ago, three people wanted a painting or two years ago, people like, Hey, I want, and I'm like, I have, I once a year I'll go through an email and say, Hey, I'm sorry. Not that I didn't want to do your painting. I just don't really go on Facebook. Right. It's like, like, I don't, okay, look, like when you were sending me the stuff, I was like, send it through email. I, I took email off my phone. So that it's like my, everyone's like, why do not you have, I no, because I don't want another thing to look at. Hmm. Right. Like it, it I, I like, I don't, cause I don't want to be caught in the cycle of like email, Instagram, YouTube, this, 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 cause you don't get as much done. Yeah. Right. So I was like, now I, I check my email in the morning I check it at night. And like, how long have we been talking about this? Like two years. <laughs> right yeah, maybe like you're like hey months. do you want to do it i'm like yeah, yeah. and then i was like and then, and then like the, the like the pandemic like bummed me out for like two yeah. years and i just wasn't in the zone right yeah. And I was like, yeah i'm just not feeling creative like i don't i don't feel like in, in, the, in the right zone or whatever so i think yeah timing but yes thank you for being persistent persistent yeah, of course of course well thank you again for coming on i uh, really appreciate it and uh yeah thank you